Hi there, everyone. Hugo Bound Anderson here. So very excited to have you all here today uh, to go through and learn with us how to build end-to-end -end recommendation systems uh, at reasonable scale. I am here today um, and soon to introduce to you uh, with, I'm here with Jacopo Tagliabue, who is a Rexis expert and former director of AI at Covio and Ronai Ak, a senior data scientist on the NVIDIA Merlin team. Um, very excited to, to be with both of both of them today. Um, but we're gonna get started in a couple of minutes. In, in, in the meantime, if you'd like to introduce yourself in the chat on YouTube and let us know kind of why you're interested in this stuff, what, what you do, whether you're a data scientist or ML engineer or platform engineer or what you're interested in, um and uh where you work and that, that type of stuff and what you work on that'd be super cool all right we'll get started in a couple of minutes thanks Hi everyone, Hugo Ban Anderson here. Uh, welcome uh, today to our live coding session on how to build end-to-end -end recommendation systems at reasonable scale. Um, so excited to have you here today. So excited to be here with uh, my colleagues and friends, Jacopo Tagliabue, uh, who is a Rexis expert and former director of AI at Covio, who we've just discovered is also in many ways the uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger of ML Ops, and here with uh, Ronai Ak, a senior data scientist on the NVIDIA Merlin team. Um, if you'd, we'll get started in a minute. If you'd love to introduce yourself in the chat, that, that'd be great. We've got a couple of people who've already introduced themselves. Kai Graham, who's a data scientist working on some collaborative filtering related to retail brands. Great. And, and Kai is um, exclaiming, excited for this. We also have Preet Bawa, uh, an ML engineer working for Optum. Um, and they built a recommendation model that can rank personalized recommendations for users. So very curious to, to know more. Um, amazing. We also have uh, Kim Swoon, who's a senior data scientist in the North Korean Institute of Technology, working on high dimensional topological data analysis. Great to, great to have you here. Um, and we'll get started very, very soon. We'll just take one more minute to let more people in. All right. Well, I'm I'm so excited. I'd love to get started. So perhaps uh, Jacopo and Ranai, we could turn our cameras on. Ciao. Hey there, team. How are you both? Welcome. Thank you. Hello. Um, so great to have you both here. Thanks for having us. Absolutely. Um, and there are more people joining. We've actually got Jeresh, who you'll both be interested in this, uh, founder for Fractal Data Mines, this decision support product and consultancy working on causal AI in, in, in Rexis. Um, and, you know, these are, these are things that Jacobo, you and I have talked about every, every now and then, but um, 
you know, causal modeling in these types of systems is is fascinating. So it's it's great to have everyone here. We've got Ayush, who's a senior uh, MLS at Microsoft, um, who wants to learn more about the NVIDIA Merlin ecosystem as well. Um, so, um, and Christian has a question. Um, thank you for joining from Spain where it's 1 a.m. That's a real, real hardcore. Um, and yes, this video will remain on our YouTube channel. Um, so just before jumping in, I've, I've, I've said this already, but I'd like to say Jacopo is a Rexis ex expert and former director of AI at Covio. Uh, Ranai is a senior data scientist on the NVIDIA Merlin team. Um, and we all um, did a project and worked on a blog post together which I'm going to share in the chat here, um, which you can check out. But one of the things I'm really excited about is Jacopo, we did a live stream recently, um, which is kind of an MVP of these types of recommendation systems. Um, but what we're doing here is really doing end to end, showing all the, all the nuts and bolts, right? So showing how we can build a pipeline with all the necessary ingredients. So data ops with Snowflake and DBT, training Merlin models in parallel, leveraging Metaflow, experiment parameter tracking, we may show some Comet and also Metaflow cards for this type of stuff, um, serving cache predictions, um, using using batch, all, all of these, these types of things. So really showing all the nuts and bolts of these the, these types of pipelines, which is kind of the, the real meat of it, which is which is su super exciting. Um, and I, I think um, that having been said, without further ado, um, it'd be great to go through some of these slides just to set the scene, um, and we can kind of kind of move from there. And I'll just say um, if anybody. Uh, has any questions in the YouTube chat, just do ask them in the chat and uh, we'll uh, get to them when when possible. Um, so the first thing to note is that you can quote unquote, um, uh, have a look at the code on in your own browser or in, in, in the repository. I'd like to say you can code along, but that's that's not entirely true because there is um, a not a non-trivial amount of setup that needs, uh, needs to be done. But what I'm gonna do is share this GitHub uh, repository um, and perhaps you could even open the GitHub repository so we could have a quick look at it. Oh yeah, sure. Let me let me go out of the. Can you can you still see my can you still see my? Yeah, screen? it looks beautiful. Yeah. So yeah, if we just scroll down on yeah. the README, you'll you'll actually see what I just just said, and you'll you'll see. Yep, everything's here. A lot of links here. You get a sense of how all these things work work together. Um, and what you need to set up from, and this is part of the point. This, I mean, you can't just do this out of the box because you can't do these types of things purely out of the box, right? Um, you are required to piece a whole bunch of stuff together, such as your Snowflake account, AWS, uh, Metaflow, DBT, all, all, all of these types of things. Um, so I just wanted to give a bit of context uh, around that, please. If I can, yes, if I can just point out, like the, the readme is fairly verbose and long hopefully because it kind of tells you everything you need to run um and it's been tested from other people as well so it's not just in our head this actually works end to end it just requires a bit of upfront commitment because since this is actually going to be you know production ready in many senses we're going to see in which ones you know it requires your data warehousing it requires your you know your your you know your uh dynamo db it requires a bunch of pieces that normally in the tutorials we don't do because the tutorial is kind of like a more of a, you know, local kind of first tab. So this is actually a fully end-to-end -end pipeline that, that can run even with GPUs if we turn it on, you know, at the full volume, so to speak. Uh, so the readme is long. Up to uh, 11. Uh, but it, yeah, but it's rewarding. Like my point is like it's rewarding. So what we're going to do today is no worries. We're going to run it on a setup that has already been made. So the effort has already been made once. And then we're going to see when that effort has been made how easy it is to actually go through the pieces together. That's kind of the, the, the point here. Exactly. Um, and to be clear, although this is some effort, this is relatively little lift compared to the world pre-Yakapo, in, 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 in my opinion. And I mean that quite, quite seriously. And that's one of the reasons I love doing these sessions, because if you were to try to do this using resources that are out there before we kind of, Yakapo started and, and colleagues started talking about how to do reasonable scale ML and AI, it's it it's highly significant 
uh, lift. And in fact, a lot of it was siloed within um, big tech organizations as, as well. So it wasn't even clear how to how to hand roll this type of stuff yourself. So all, the point is, although this does take time, it's significantly less time than it did pre these types of resources, which is one of the reasons I said we've got to we've got to go and do this, um, Jacopo. So fantastic. So yeah, let's just jump back to the slides. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I just wanted to give an idea next of the structure of today. Uh, we'll be giving um, an overview of the pipeline. Um, we'll be talking about the actual use cases um, and the the data set we'll be using, which is fashion recommendations. Um, then Ranai will be telling us uh, all the great stuff about Merlin and how to do deep uh, learning modeling with it. And then we're going to jump in to doing the live the, the live coding and Jacopo will will be doing this live so we'll hopefully the 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 live demo uh gods will shine on us today <laughs> hopefully but, hopefully nothing breaks <laughs> exactly yeah awesome uh, okay so yeah let's let's do it Jacopo take it away yeah so I just wanted to give you so first of all thanks so much for being here I don't know why um Hugo keeps on, on saying that I'm the expert because I, I know a bit of Rexis by way less than Ronai. And I know a bit of Metaflow by way less than Hugo. So like, there's one person that is the expert here. It's certainly not me. Um, but, you know, today um, we, we're going to do like somehow um, like an Herculean effort to basically build an entire pipeline together. I know it sounds like a lot and it's a bit overwhelming at first. But what we're going to see is that when the pieces, when you pick the right components, and you know, in some sense, our job was to pick these components for you and assemble them. You're gonna find out that in approximately 500 lines of Python, you can run a, a deep learning state-of-the-art um, uh, pipeline for recommendations. Okay, uh, which before the advent of something like Metaflow, uh, DBT, Merlin, and you know, and a bunch of our things from our friend AWS would have required you maybe you know a team of 10 people. Uh, now, while it's a relatively complex project, um, it can really be managed by, by a very, very small team if you understand what we're doing. So that said, this is what we're trying to build. There are four main components, okay? And again, the repo is going to showcase all of them. All of this is reproducible. All of this is open, okay? So we're not going to devote the same amount of time to all of this because some of these things are you know, more interesting, I guess, for our MA crowd and some things are less. So there's the first component, which is where is the data, and now we get the data from a raw format to an actionable format, which is going to be done through uh, Snowflake as our warehouse of choice and DBT as an open source tool to transform this data and put them in a tabular format that we can use. Then we're going to go into the Python world, and we're going to use Metaflow to build this pipeline and using NVIDIA Tabular and NVIDIA Merlin for basically training our recommender model. Okay, We're going to run some tests. And then finally, we're going to take the prediction that we built and we're going to serve them to the cloud. Okay? So we're going to go from raw data as you can sit on your warehouse or in your data lake, whatever you have it, to a real endpoint that we're going to see in the browser. You can ping with your user ID and it's going to get you back immediately as a result, some recommendation. And I'll just say so, for those of you who haven't so, seen Metaflow uh, before, Metaflow essentially is a framework that helps data scientists and ML engineers to write, manage, deploy, run their machine learning workflows um, in a production environment and prototype them uh, locally. Um, there are a, a number of moving parts. A lot of people do use it as an orchestrator, but I always say you kind of come for the orchestrator and stay for the visualization tools um, or stay for the access to the compute layer and that type of stuff. So what, what we'll see is that with decorators such as at batch, you're able to send different steps up to AWS batch to do whatever you need or run it locally and and, and, and that type of stuff. So that's just a few words on, on, on the power of Metaflow. For those who don't know. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, sorry. I, I tend to be, you know, like I, I'm so comfortable now and used to it that I kind of forget. You are an expert, as I said. Uh, again, 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 alpha, alpha expert. Um, but yeah. So today, what we're gonna we're gonna see, and again, for everything that we cannot we cannot go into 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 um, um, in some depth today, please refer to the repo, the, the the blog post, and everything is fully documented. But what we're gonna try and show you is how to build what it's called a user item recommender system. What is the user item recommender system? Is the most you know straightforward use case for recommendation, right? In this case, it's about fashion. So the idea is that we have some shoppers 
They really like to buy fashion stuff. And we have a history of their transaction. So we know what they did in the past. And what we're trying to do is to build a machine learning model that given a user will predict what this user is going to like next. Okay, This is you know, the most classic possible recommendation system use case you can imagine. It falls as an MLOps pattern in what we call offline training, offline serving, because what we're going to do, and it's going to illustrate it here, is we're going to basically simulate a case in which we can collect all the data from shoppers, let's say, on Monday. Okay, We're going to run the pipeline that we will see today at night. And we're gonna serve, we're gonna basically cache all the prediction for our shoppers based on the model that we train. When Tuesday come and shoppers go to our website, what we're gonna do is we're gonna basically ask our cache to give us back the recommendation and we're gonna serve them to the user. And then at Tuesday night, you can imagine that you know how this goes on. We're gonna retrain the model, the caching recommendation, and so on and so forth. Okay. This is the most widely patterned the adopted pattern in MLOps for recommendation system because it kind of combines the flexibility uh, of doing whatever model you want because it's you know offline so some things like latency and and you know training time is less important okay and it's very flexible it means that many many use cases can be kind of like you know fleshed out in this type of things is by no means the only things you can do for example if you have not many shoppers that are that are coming back Tuesday imagine you have something that you have some shoppers on Monday and then on Tuesday, a lot of new people shows up. Of course, you can see that this pattern alone won't, you know, won't satisfy all your user. So there are other techniques to do that. For example, session-based recommendation. Merlin has a devoted library for that. So you can, you, you're encouraged to go and, and explore that. But for today, we're going to just stick with this user item use case. Great. And Jacobo, we actually have a, great, a couple of great questions sure. in the chat from cool. Jiresh. Um, how much effort would be required to get this with a different stack for some components? For example, Hive instead of Snowflake. Um, and similarly, how much effort to do it in a different cloud environment? I can speak to Metaflow's capabilities to be able to use different cloud environments. Once you have your cloud set up, um, I mean, Metaflow is multi-cloud. So you're able to use essentially decorators, as we'll see, to send it to whatever cloud you actually want, whether that be... Um, you know, AWS, GCP, or, or or Azure. Maybe you want to say a few more words about that, or yeah. about the the data part of the stack as well. It, it's a, it's a, I mean, it's a fantastic question. I think all these things are like loosely coupled by their functionality. So, for example, if you have BigQuery or Redshift or even a data lake, like you know, I don't know, uh, Databricks with with Spark, you can basically still use the same DBT code that is there to prepare the the, the data. It's gonna it should run basically exactly the same depending on some minor SQL dialect difference that you know about. And for the serving part, while we're using AWS Lambda from AWS, the same exact offering is available in all the other clouds. So you just basically have to swap out Lambdas with, I don't know, Azure functions, but the general feeling is going to be basically exactly the same. Fantastic. Thank you. Barona, please, all yours for the fun part. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I would like to thank Hugo for inviting me. And it's a great uh, opportunity for me to take part in. And um, also, this is not only me like uh, doing the job from Merlin team. I would like to also thank all the Merlin team uh, engineers. If they are listening to me right now, <laughs> Sarah might be here. You know Sarah very well. All right. So, um, Jakub mentioned you about the full pipeline. He show you the uh, high level of uh, high level components of the pipeline. So after doing some preparations, data preparations, data cleaning, Jakub is going to show you about this part as well. Um, so now it's step to step. We, we can move on to the step where we do feature engineering and pre-processing, right? Um, for that, we are going to use. Actually, we are using. Uh, 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 an, an open source library called MB Tabular. MB Tabular actually designed by NVIDIA Merlin team. It is a library for feature engineering and pre-processing. We, we like to call it accelerated feature engineering pre and pre-processing and to design, design quickly and easily manipulate terabytes of Tabular data. And so what is it capable of? 
Actually, uh, it is capa capable of executing uh, uh, feature engineering, feature pre-processing pipelines, both on CPU and GPU. And um, it can scale uh, 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 to larger than memory data sets uh, by streaming from data, uh, data from disk and transforming them in chunks. And actually, it, it has high-level APIs that let us to create complicated feature engineering and pre-processing workflows. And uh, there are like several operators that we develop uh, in the MV Tabular library that really helps us to uh, uh, create features, new features. You know that feature engineering is a very important step and also transform these features. So how you will transform your categorical features, how you will transform your continuous features. We all, uh, we, we created these operators for users that they can easily uh, um, perform such operations, right? And it is uh, very much seamlessly integrated with other libraries of uh, uh, Merlin in the Merlin uh, ecosystem. So uh, like Merlin models, CCTR, or it can be directly used by the native PyTorch on TensorFlow. All right, next one. And before I talk about the modeling part, uh, there was a question about like how if this entire pipeline can be used on different cloud platform, right? So Merlin is also cloud agnostic. You can use Merlin libraries in any cloud platform. Uh, it can be AWS, Azure, uh, uh, GCP, or a, a different uh, cloud platform. So for the data pre-processing pipeline, we use MV Tabular. Uh, when it comes to modeling, uh, Merlin has different modeling libraries, but I would like to focus on one is called Merlin models. But let's talk about the architecture first. What we use in this, uh, uh, I, I like to call it proof of concept example. We use an architecture, actually it's a scalable and well-known architecture called two tower. So as you can see that from the picture here, the, the, the actually we see in the image, two, we see two towers right in the image. So we can call these two towers as encoders, right? And one encoder tower is, for user, for the user features, and one other one, the, the other one is for the item. So for the user part, actually, um, basically this is a deep learning architecture, right? We have like two tower, the use the uh, two tower that we use the deep learning, uh, deep learning uh, methods like a uh, neural network architecture. And then uh, the main goal here, how can we represent as Yakubu mentioned, there's a user uh, item interaction data set. How can we represent users and items? So basically when we say, when I say represent, meaning that can we extract their hidden representations? In other words, like generate embeddings, right? How are we gonna do that? Basically, this is a, a, an architecture that we generally think it as a retrieval model because, or we can use this for a retrieval use case when we don't have explicit negatives in our data set, which is the case for this, uh, for this pipeline. So we can take this as a retrieval architecture and then we can feed user IDs and extra side information together with, with the user IDs and item IDs, right? So it is possible to, and that's also one of the advantage of using two tower architecture, it's possible to feed extra side information to the, to the model. And then through the training, basically we do some sort of uh, negative sampling technique. And through this negative sampling technique, actually we learn the re representations, user and item representations. Basically you can call them latent representations. And then we do some sort of like uh, similarity type of calculation in this example is dot product. And then we calculate the scores. And if uh, for a given user pair and item pair, if the score is higher, that, might, that means that this item is a better match for this user, right? So overall, this is the idea behind the two tower architecture that we use for this POC example. Next one, please. That's awesome. And we actually have a mm -hmm. question um, sure. in the chat. I, I think the answer is no, but well, could you go back one slide? Um, and is the, the question is, is the DAG on the right auto-generated by NV Tabular? The, sorry, can I? Can is I... the, is the DAG on the right auto-generated by NV Tabular? The, I couldn't understand the question. Is the, is this regarding this or is this regarding the, the previous? The... No, the, yeah, so the image on, on this slide. The, no, I, 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 this image actually uh, is, 
Okay, so is this related to image resource? Where this image is coming from? Yes, exactly. Oh, sorry, I misunderstood. I was on, <laughs> I was hearing you as a dad, like directed a cyclic graph. I think I work with graphs a lot, so I understand. Yeah. That. So sorry. Well, yeah. Yeah. So this image was adopted from a paper. Uh, we are also citing this, and if it's, I think it's visible. So we adopted this image from a from a research paper. If that's the question, did I yeah, understand? Exactly. Did, did I understand yeah. this correctly? Okay. Okay. Yeah, is there, that's is there correct. Okay, okay, I see, I see. Is there okay, okay, if there is any follow-up question, yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Great. But this this one was uh, uh, generated by me. <laughs> I used to, this one generated by me. Sorry, I misunderstood. I was thinking DAG, and that's what no, I No, no, I did say DAG because but yeah, <laughs> let's let's move on. Yeah, perfect, perfect, perfect. Okay. We train a model, right? Jakub is going to show you a Michable workflow pipeline. He's going to show you his training pipeline. And then he mentioned that this is a, like a classical offline prediction use case uh, when he was presenting his slides. What does this mean? This means that uh, we are not going to do like a real time online predictions here, but we will generate predictions offline. And then we will present these predictions for, the, for, a, for, for a, a given user, right? But the question, how are we going to generate the predictions? Okay, we, we train our model, the model is trained. We have our model, you can save the model, but how am I gonna generate offline predictions from this trained model? So for that, we developed a TopK encoder a class. And I don't wanna go into detail. I can go into details when Jacob is showing you the uh, source, uh, source code, but we developed a TopK encoder class that we can actually generate a TopK model from the saved model. The same model is our entire architecture, right? Our entire two tower architecture. And what is happening here when you when you have your train model, now you are able to actually export your item tower. You can name it also candidate tower. You are able to also export your query tower. You can name it also uh, user tower. Once you do this, you can basically generate your embeddings. So when, gener uh, when, when we do generate embeddings, we can also, uh, benefit from uh, uh, item features, which is important, right? When we want to cache the candidate embeddings, we can use the uh, 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 item features and by using the also uh, item catalog, then we cache, we can cache our candidate embeddings. And then whenever we have a new uh, a user coming, right? A query coming, we can actually generate, uh, generate embedding for this user query from the user user tower. And then since we already cached our candidate embeddings, we can we are able to calculate the scores in between by doing some dot product. So basically this is happening with just like two lines of code. We have a top K encoder class and then we generate, uh, we created a top K uh, uh, encoder method. And then you just actually give the candidate features under the hood, it is generating candidate embeddings and it is under the hood, it is also generating the user embedding for a user query doing the dot product, calculating the score. And then from there, you can actually, based on the scores, you can uh, uh, you can return the top K, uh, uh, top K items with the highest scores, right? This is how it is happening under the hood. Hope that explains the pipeline. I think Fantastic. the next slide is yours, Jacob, right? Yes, yes. Yeah. I just wanted to say that, you know, actually, which is, I think is a testament on the work of, you know, or the NVIDIA team, the code that it actually does this is much shorter than the image that actually depicts this. So we're <laughs> gonna see this like, it's actually super easy to actually use this in, in, in production. Uh, so, I mean, uh, I don't know who, if there's some more question or this question or- Yeah, there, there, there are a couple questions. Um, Juresh asked um, back to dependencies. So the DBT dependency is a hard dependency, but the rest is pluggable. I mean, technically, you can you can take the same SQL query and orchestrate and orchestrate it yourself. I wouldn't call it a hard dependencies. Everything here is swappable, and the vast majority of this is open source. That in you can you can find other alternatives that are open source as well. But my argument is, if you keep the code constant, meaning uh, DBT in this picture, this picture is perfect. DBT Merlin and kind of the lambda part, you can swap out the hardware. The running mm -hmm. by swapping out different different cloud fairly easy. Okay, then if you want to change also the BT, you can right. There's no there's no problem. But but since it's open source and it runs on different engines, uh, I I think it's easier to just swap out the engine instead of the entire thing. Yep. 
Great. Um, and Preet has a good question. Did um, did you guys explore existing word to vec or or glove for item embeddings? Uh, so I, I, my, the first tutorial that we did, so there's a direct tutorial on other bounds website, which is actually built with, you know, word to back, basically script can base, uh, tutorial yep. that does recommendation system. And it was the code along that we did. I think the YouTube video is available. Google, correct me if it I'm is. Wrong. Yeah. And I'll, so, I'll find that and share it. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So that would be great compared to the, to the capabilities of these models. Uh, the, the skipper model is much simpler. So good, good thing is much simpler to understand, much, much easier to train. Uh, you know, cons is not state of the art in the same sense that the architecture is. Great. And there's one other question, which is, um, can you recommend any good resources or books on recommender systems? And I'd say <laughs> this, this I'm is a great. I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, Ronai, please, you do this. <laughs> well, I would recommend your uh, your uh, course first of all. I would recommend your machine learning course, and I think I would recommend people to start with first of all one hundred one machine learning, and then they can move on to the introduction to recommender system. There are a lot of <laughs> books out there, but yeah. Uh, so um, start with uh, start with Jakub's courses and uh, course slides, and start with his <laughs> blog post. Definitely. Yeah, yeah we, we have so my my, the, my NYU course is a, which is which is open source. Like there's a yeah. there's a component of, of recommender system, which is an introduction. Uh, some of the things we said last time about the Skipper model actually come from that. So it's a very gentle introduction. So it won't get you super far, but it should get you the basics to understand how the field progresses. Uh, if you want to do more complex stuff, the uh, NVIDIA website, NVIDIA Merlin, has a lot of tutorials that you can run on Jupyter Notebooks on different level of complexity. So that's also a good resource. Um, and I think Barry Bishop, I don't know if he's here, but like, uh, is writing a new textbook on recommended system. Barry, if you're here, like, hi. Um, but yeah, so th there's a, like the field, the field changed very quickly. Uh, and so, you know, like also another good way to, to kind of like keep in sync is like, you know, know what people are doing in the research side and, and so on. Great. So, I'm sorry, that um, was, a terrible, was a terrible answer. No, no, that's a fantastic <laughs> answer. So let's move on. We've got some more questions, yeah. but I think they'll come out as we go through the code. And if yeah. there are any questions yeah. that aren't answered, I've, I've linked to our community Slack where you can come and chat with us about it there as well. Exactly, yeah. I remember like, you know, we're not falling off the face. So there are to find us on the, on, the, on the Slack if you want to chat for something later, it's probably fine in exactly. the next few days. Uh, yep. So, but I just wanted to to get a bit of a feeling like code wise of what we're doing to put some flesh into these ideas that we discussed. Um, as you know, the slides are awesome, but I think you know working code um, is actually better. Uh, so this is a snowflake. I think this is a vanilla snowflake instant. Does, doesn't have anything aside from from the data that, that we're talking about. But I want to show you the first thing in this pipeline and the last thing in this pipeline immediately. So we know what is the start and where do we end. So this is the start. Okay, this start is, you see here on my left, there's a, as you see here, there's a schema called H&M Bro, and it basically contains just the simple files that you can find on the H&M data set that we're using, okay? This table here, you see here, is a real example of this data set. So when you click on this, you're gonna find basically a JSON representation of a product. You see here, this is a vest top, and uh, is category ladies wear and uh, you know it has an article ID whatever okay you can see this table this table tells you all these articles if you if you if you do the preview on the customers what you're gonna get guess you're gonna get the same thing but for users okay you see so every user now is represented you know anonymously as a set of properties okay what, what we do and we do this through a dbt project is that we take this data which is very raw and then we want to build the final tables that we need to use for the model, okay? But before showing you this, I want to move on this table here. Can you see my tab? So you see yep. here, this is a Lambda address, okay? And this is a simple get endpoint that takes as input a user ID. A user ID is one of the things that I showed before. It's just, you know, the name of a customer in this anonymized data set. And when you run it, and you're actually gonna run it, you're gonna get back a JSON that tells you a list of items, which is a list of products that the model recommends for this user. This is the very end of it. So this is an endpoint that you can publish 
that you basically make available all the prediction of your model for your user. This does not require any infrastructure maintenance from your side because this is based on AWS Lambda, so serverless computing. So AWS is gonna run this for you and scale it up when you need it. And the data is gonna be saved behind the scene in DynamoDB, which is also something you do not run because AWS manage and scale it for you. Again, the same type of technology is available in Edica provider, they just call different names, okay? But it's very important that we go from this, the data is raw as possible, to an actual live system, this, without deploying any infrastructure. Like we're not gonna be responsible to deploy literally any single server, okay? And I think that's one of the beauty of this pipeline is the ability to abstract away the entire infrastructure cycle for you. Good? Okay. Fantastic. So uh, before we go into the, uh, into the actual code, let's see what the structure of the pipeline actually is when you go a bit deeper than our, you know, than our chart. And to, and to talk through this, look what I'm using. I'm using actually a feature of Metaflow. This is a Metaflow card. So this is actually generated automatically by running the pipeline, okay? This documentation is automatically generated by Metaflow every time you run it, okay? And so we're gonna use it now just to talk through and see you know, how this pipeline is built. You can see here, this is the DAG. So we're not, we're now we have a DAG, okay? With a start um, point, an endpoint and the end. And each one of these DAG is part of our, um, uh, of our pipeline. And our pipeline is relatively straightforward function-wise. So you see here, we first start with getting the data set. Then we use MB tabular as you know, Rona uh, suggested that we're gonna train the Merlin model. You see here, there's a bunch of blocks, okay? Is the idea that instead of training just one model with this very same pipeline, we can train as many models as we want in parallel. Okay, then we're gonna pick the best model of all the one that we trained. We're gonna test it. We're gonna save the predictions. And then at the end, we're gonna catch them, okay? So this is basically the entire pipeline that we're gonna go through again. And this is being generated by the same code that actually runs the pipeline, okay? So let's go to the first part, which is the getting the data set, okay? And by getting this up, what it means is that we're gonna read from Snowflake the data that MB tabular needs to build the model, okay? So before going into the Python code, let's go and see the data. So the data that we find here, you know, when you run it, it's gonna, it's gonna come, you know, see this here, H&M post is a schema that gets generated while you prepare the data. So you see there's a fantastic table here called filtered data frame. And you can see here reading from this table what Snowflake is presenting me. So this is a table that combines metadata about the use, about the data, sorry, about the item. So product, article, color group, blah, 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 with data about the customer that actually bought this, you know, the price, postage code, and so on, okay? If you imagine, put yourself in the shoes of a recommender system, like the one that Ron I described. What we want is to get a list of transactions that tells me which product with which feature was bought by which user in which time. And this table accomplished this perfectly, okay? Again, this table is not a given. This table has been built by, response, a dbt flow, okay? So when, what happens is that through dbt, which is basically a collection of SQL uh, queries in a DAG, you see here the DAG display using, again, natively dbt docs. So this is generated by dbt, again, fully open source, okay? So we went from the original data that we have here on the left to the final data here on the right, which is the final table that we see in my Snowflake account, okay? So we're now gonna switch to the Python view in Metaflow. When we do read the data, we're gonna read the data from this table here that we prepared, okay? And the beauty of that is that Snowflake is very, very powerful. So if you imagine this, in a real setting when the data keeps growing. The cool thing about Snowflake is that this table can basically be run at a million row, two million row, 10 million row, a hundred million row, a billion row with the same exact code and no changes because Snowflake is still gonna run basically everything you throw at it up until, mm. you know, up until a very, very reasonable point, okay? So let me, I'm gonna share my, 
Visual Studio now. Can you see my Visual Studio? Yeah, that looks great. Okay, awesome. So let me let me launch the command. So now we're gonna run the flow. This is called my Merlin flow. It's a file again. If you if you are online in the GitHub repo, I think the GitHub repo is in Zoom as like is in the is in the chat as well. So you can you can literally follow the same code you see here. It's completely public, so you can follow along. To run it, we just run it with the standard, you know, Metaflow with our standard Metaflow uh, commands. And while I start running, we're gonna start and go to it and commenting and see and see how the DAG that I show gets implemented. Okay. So let me start from the from the very very bottom. And do you want to just um make the terminal slightly smaller so we can see more of your code? Can you? Yeah, can that's you good. See now better. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Okay, so you can see you can see on the on the bottom part, um, Metaflow is running these steps. You see here, start is the first step. You know, get data set is the one that we saw. So it's gonna run as we speak. Okay, and then we're gonna we're gonna see the different thing. Okay, you see here, this is the query that has been run, and then this is the example of the row that is being retrieved. Okay, if you remember this, you see this. This is exactly the same field that we saw in the metadata table before. And then we're going to build the data set with the training set, the validation test, and the test set. Okay. Uh, the structure of this, for those of you who are not familiar with Metaflow, so is a simple, is a simple class here. You see here, it's, it's, it's been mentioned at the at the at the very end of the file in the in the main method. And then you can see here, this is just one single class. For pedagogical purposes, you can you can split it if you want. But genetically speaking, just one class, which inherits the flow spec from Metaflow. You see here, okay, mm -hmm. and a bunch of other stuff that we're gonna go through it. Okay, every time every node in the DAG that I show you, every part of this pipeline is implemented in one single way. Is implemented as a Python function inside of this class with the step decorator on top. The step decorator on top of the function tells Metaflow that this is one node in the pipeline and Metaflow is smart enough to figure out the order of this pipeline. How? Let's, let's take the first, the first class here, the first function here. You see here, there's a special word here called next. Can you guess what it does? Well, obviously it tells you know, the function where to go next after it's done with, the, with, with this, right? So the first one is gonna be the start function. And then the self next is gonna tell us that the next one is gonna be the next data set, okay? Which is this one. And can you guess which one is at the end? When you go at the end of get data set, it's gonna be build workflow, which is this one. And then, you know, you, 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 can, see, you can see how that works, okay? Each one of this function decorated with step is basically its own specific isolated compute node, so to speak. Which means, which is what happening right now. You see my, you see my uh, my terminal. You see that there's a uh, there's a there's a runnable uh, messenger. This is because we send this pipeline to AWS Batch automatically without doing anything, just by using a decorator here. Okay, and we can do that because each of the step is kind of isolated, so it can be run locally or you know remotely, depending on you know on on the on the on the on the compute that we want. So in particular, if you want to go, in this case, we're gonna see the train model function. You see here, train model, okay? And you see here a decorator that is not anywhere else to be found before, which is the batch decorator, which has an image, which is of course a Docker container and a memory requirement. Hugo, would you want to elaborate a bit on, you know, on, on this capability of Metaflow? Yeah. Yeah. I think one thing I'll say is that if you, so if you want to be prototyping locally on, you know, a smaller training set or whatever it is, um, you wouldn't use a decorator like that. And once you figure out kind of what, what, what your prototype code looks like and you want to send it um, up to batch or wherever it is, or you can use add Kubernetes to send it up to a Kubernetes cluster or whatever you're interested in. Part of the thing, one of the things I really love about Metaflow is that you you don't need any changes to your code besides having a decorator. You don't need to mess around with con configuration files or anything along those lines once everything is is set up and you can just write pure Python in order to send the same code to any cloud instance that you like. And in this case, we're sending it to AWS Batch, but 
you can send it anywhere, essentially, um, and back and forth between your local workstation and and the cloud. Um, the other thing I'll make clear, you may, you know, where your mind may go, depending on um, your level of sophistication, is, um, you know, how do I make sure I have the same packages in installed locally and on my batch instance and that type of stuff. And you'll see that Jacobo is using an app pip decorator um, to, to make sure that um, dependencies are synced in, in, in a way that makes sense as well. This is a bit of an, so there's a bunch of advanced Metaflow stuff here. Uh, so one is that the batch decorator is actually wrapped around a meta decorator, which we yep. would say we invented. That is called enable decorator. So what it, what it happens is that it allows us to switch on and off batch depending on environmental variable. So we don't even have to change the code. So basically the meta decorator, enable decorator, enables batch only when we want it to. So we don't even have to change. You know, we can just leave batch all the time and just switch it on and off. There's one very important thing here is the GPU, which is commented for this case to save a bit of money. But you can run the exact same code that we show you today. This is the training stuff on the GPU. And this is thanks to Merlin, because this image here, which is the official Merlin image uh, that you can find, you know, that you can find um, uh, in NVIDIA and has been just ported to ECR for convenience, but it's the exact same code, runs exactly the same in CPU and GPU. So now we're running on a CPU, okay? So it can be a bit slower, but we're also running on a smaller data set. But the exact same code, if you uncomment this, it's gonna run on the GPU in the cloud, okay? Which I think is like fantastic because it gives you one level, it goes one level deeper than what, you know, Ugo was correctly says, you can start locally and then you go into the cloud. I raise you with, you can start locally, go into the cloud with CPU and go to the cloud on the GPU. So you, you mm. can actually have even one more level of granularity without ever changing your code, so to speak. If that makes sense. Absolutely. Um, the train part, you know, it's probably the most complex. I mean, not the most complex, probably the most interesting part of the entire pipeline because it's where the intelligence goes. Uh, it's very easy to work with this, thanks to, thanks, to, uh, thanks to Merlin. But I would love, so it's literally, and I'm not kidding you, a deep learning model can be trained from here to here, which is 18 lines of code. If I'm not, you know, if I'm not, if I, I don't know, Ugo, you're the one good at math. Um, but yeah, like it, it's incredible. But, uh, you know, may, maybe Rona, if you can, if you can, if you can just, you know, guide us a bit to the, you know, to sure. just, you know, what these lines are actually doing. Yeah, that would be sure. awesome. Yeah. Sure, sure, definitely. So when, before you reach that point, actually, you, you know, that you already executed the every tabular workflow. So yeah. why, why this is important? Let's first talk about, yeah, exactly. So when you when you started with the Tableau workflow, actually, yeah, you get this get uh, underscore MVT underscore workflow function, and your MV Tableau workflow ran under the hood. And if we can scroll down a little bit, go back to where we read the data set objects, right? Before, oh, yeah. yeah, exactly. So when uh, when we do the MV Tableau workflow, there's one thing we do in the workflow. We actually tag. We we call it tagging. We actually tag every feature. So tagging is an important part for me in the in the Merlin uh, uh, Merlin pipeline. Why? Because tagging for for us is a metadata. So what we do actually we tag every feature. It can be a categorical feature. It can be a continuous feature. Feature can be a list feature, and it can be actually a, a, a context feature. So uh, we add this metadata information, and when the Metable uh, workflow is executed, it transforms the data, et cetera, et cetera, then we can actually export, uh, export a schema file. It's a, actually, now it's a, it's a prototext file or a JSON file. We export a schema file, which we will actually consume later in the modeling phase, and which will do the glue work for us. So what is happening here, we exported process files from MV Tableau workflow as parquet files, and we exported them on the disk. And uh, Jakub is reading them back, as you see the uh, line 292, line 293 here. He's reading them back to be able to feed them to the model, right? To be able to do the training, evaluation. When he reads them back, if you notice that they come, uh, we, we read them as data set objects. When you read them with the data set objects, actually they carry this schema information. So our data carries this schema information, which is an important part, if you scroll down a little bit, when we create user tower and item tower. 
Two tower architecture, two towers, right? User tower, item tower. So how we design Merlin models? Merlin models actually a modeling library, particularly uh, particularly uh, designed for uh, like modeling, right? Uh, deep learning or machine learning model training, and it is built on uh, TensorFlow currently. So, but we 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 use. TensorFlow API, TF Keras APIs as well, but also we, uh, we ingested our own design choices too, like schema. So what we do here, uh, we create a user schema by uh, getting the training data and just doing the dot schema, uh, using the dot schema uh, method and selecting the user tag. Remember I said that in the workflow, you tag the features. You tag the features if they are categorical, if they are uh, continuous, and you can also tag them. Is Are these user features? Are they, are they item features, right? So we tag them already as user features. So what is he doing? He's selecting, distinguishing the user schema from the item schema. So he creates two schemas. And then we create, we can easily create encoder towers by using this encoder um, functionality. So from the uh, from the schemas, we can create user uh, users tower input block input layer, and we, from the item schema, we can create the item tower item block, right input block basically. Sorry, and then we can create the encoders as he's showing here. It's all using the schema because schema carries the information, and model knows that this is a user tower. Oh, I know this is a categorical feature. Now I need to create an embedding layer. Oh, this, these are continuous features. Oh, I know what to do. I know how to aggregate my continuous information to my uh, the, like the output of my categorical information. So everything is designed under the hood. That's why it is just like 15 or 16 or 18 lines of code. And then that's it. The rest, you can see that you just create the model by calling the two tower model uh, v2 right function and just putting your query and uh, candidate towers. That's it. And then the rest, I'm, sh I'm sure you are familiar with the compile and fit uh, syntax coming from TF Keras. You just feed your create, I mean, define your optimizer, right? Define your metrics and then just uh, feed your data in the fit, uh, train and validation data, uh, data and it runs, right? So under the hood, this is, as I said, we, we, we treat this as a retrieval model. There is no explicit negatives. We do negative sampling under the hood and we design uh, this already so it is running under the hood doing in batch negative sampling you don't see this but it's happening under the hood <laughs> so yeah hope that uh, was clear for the for the participants if there's any question i will be happy to answer i just i just want to say that in the meantime i don't know if i mean i guess you guys were not paying attention but like what 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 happens here if you if you review the 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 YouTube video, you see here that we've been basically completing our training. You see that this line here, evil results, is the one that is here. Okay. Mm -hmm. And you can see here this is the typical, you know, I mean, if you're familiar with training deep learning model, you've seen this type of things a lot of time. So in the meantime, what happened is that our AWS job batch kicks um uh you know kicks in, you get all the code, get all the dependencies run all the training, save everything. And now, you know, the pipeline can continue to the other, to the other step um, and, you know, and, and launch another job and so on and so forth. Uh, but again, yes, I guess, you know, since everybody was focused on, <laughs> on the explanation of the code, but the good news is that everything is running behind the scene. Everything's running for us in the cloud. You know, the, the task is progressing. You see here is keep on, is keep on progressing and is launching new jobs again with the same pattern to AWS patch. The, um, you know, the astute viewer would have seen now the job are much faster. Basically, you see now they go from submitted to running in a few seconds. Why that is the case? To save money, our normal configuration with AWS patch is zero machine up, which means the first job, the first time that we had to run, requires a machine to spin up to be run everything. So it takes a bit of time because AWS is not expecting us to do. But the subsequent task, which runs on the same type of infrastructure, can reuse the same computational ability. That's why they're much faster. So the difference that you see between the first step and the and the subsequent one is due to how AWS latency uh, in the batch service is basically built in. You can go out around this in many ways, either using directly Kubernetes or changing your configuration in AWS batch. Again, if you, for example, put a minimum of one machine, you won't have any delay whatsoever. 
Hugo, any questions before going forward? No, I've, I've, I've managed to answer most of them in, in, in the chat. So yeah, we can keep going. So we've got actually got six minutes of this, this stream left. So we'll see whether the everything executes in time. Yes. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, like the rest of the, the rest of the pipeline is, you know, is less exciting than the modeling part. But what's happening is that if you run more than one model in parallel, this 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 join runs is going to basically take the best of it and then it's going to basically keep it as our let's say um uh, you know candidate to basically generate prediction and i want just to show one last thing you know this is basically you know see cache prediction you see here now it was caching in dynamodb this is basically the very end of our pipeline as, as we promised to run it all i just want to show you how easy it is at the very end to do this the the project has way more you know, there are a bunch of, uh, you know, small nuggets here and there for those that, that appreciate the sort of thing in the project. So go explore them yourself. But I just want to skip to the very end and show you how easy it is to do all the serving part. It's like, I don't know, 12 lines of code, something like that. So this 12 lines of code basically use a DynamoDB table. And the only thing they do is basically append the prediction generated by Merlin and stored by Metaflow and put them online in Dynamo, okay? And this Dynamo table is the one that get access by the Lambda function powering the endpoint that we saw before. And the Lambda function, which is also in the repo, is this one, which is, I don't know, 10 lines of code, whatever, okay? This is the entire thing that you need to serve millions of predictions, like, like trained with, trained and, you know, and certified by Merlin and stored by Metaflow. This is the entire code that you need to handle the serving part in this pattern. Okay, again, no maintenance whatsoever. Once you deploy the Lambda, once you deploy DynamoDB, AWS is gonna scale it for you. Uh, so you don't have to do much. So, you know, if, if you have a lot of users, that's an happy problem, but you know, nothing is gonna come crashing down, which I think is fantastic. And of course, one thing we're not gonna show here, but it's trivial to do, maybe you will go kind of elaborate, is if you want to put this on a schedule, there's no code changes. Like if you want to run it every day, with Metaflow, we don't have to change the code to do that. Is that correct? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, once again, you would use a, dec a decorator to do that. And there are several you can use to to do so. Um, and I'll actually I include uh, a link um, to how you can schedule with all types of things from Argo workflows to step functions on AWS, if that's what you use, uh, to Airflow as well. So I'll include that link in, awesome. in the chat. And as well. before before signing before signing off, I just wanted to give you an overview of the let's say the admin version of this. So this is the AWS patch. So this is going to be you know keeping track of the job that we've been run together. This is the Lambda function that is the one that we that is powering this endpoint. Which again, it's fully working. You can do whatever you want. You can call it as much as much as you want. Well, please don't do that because that's my endpoint. But you know when you do your own endpoint, you can call it as much as you want. Um, and finally, you know, which we, we haven't gone into much uh, detail about that, but also everything has been automatically tracked using Comet. So actually the code when you run it is gonna automatically track, you see here, it's gonna automatically track all these metrics for you while you run it, in this case using Comet, and it's all there for you to share it, for example, with your teammates or you know, other people um, um, you know, in, your, um, in your organization. They may want to see, you know, how was the latest run, uh, you know, actually performing and stuff like that. And again, even comment, even in this case, another good example of like things you don't have to maintain. Uh, none of the things we saw today basically requires any infrastructure maintenance, uh, as all of them are somehow running as services managed by a uh, cloud provider or SaaS provider. Uh, and while that has some, you know, some cons at some point, happy to talk about that. We believe it's very liberating for a smaller team to, to be focused on, you know, the cool things, for example, if using Merlin, instead of being, you know, of being, you know, bogged down by infrastructure um, uh, maintenance task of like, oh, oh my God, how do I scale this? Oh my God, how do I schedule this? Like all of this, you know, in this pipeline is abstracted away, which I think is probably the biggest value of this kind of project, if that makes sense. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. And thank you so much, both of you and thanks everyone for joining we do have a bunch more questions but if you want to come into our slack and we can chat more there we can jump into there's a channel called ama guests where you can ask questions and we can just jump in and give answers um when when needed um 
but I, I, I also posted um, a link to our next um, live code along session, which is with our dear friend and former colleague Hamil Hussain, where we'll be doing natural natural language processing meeting meet, meeting MLOps, which will be super exciting uh, next month. But I just want to thank everyone for joining, but in particular to thank my wonderful guests um, Jacopo and Ronai for for joining and sharing their um, their serious expertise. Um, fantastic! So thank you, thank you both. Thanks everybody. Again. Thank you everyone. Thanks everybody. Yes, thanks, thanks everybody. Everyone. And saying we're done and a whole bunch of people are saying thank you 